have assembled mechanical keyboards before where you have to solder in each mechanical switch, but I've never gone right from a PCB where you have to solder in the hot swap sockets themselves and the diodes uh, and put all that together and then write your key map in C, use the key QMK um, command line tools to flash the key map onto the board. So this was a lot of new stuff for me, but here we are many hours later and I've finally got the Soffle built, which is a split column, um, sort of ortholinear keyboard, complete with OLED screens and rotary encoders. But was it all worth it? I've had a few split keyboards already. Um, my sort of daily driver, the one I keep going back to, is the Moonlander from ZSA. So what drew me to the Soffle? Well, actually, there was three things. Firstly, I wanted to try chock low profile switches instead of the normal MX switches. Two, I wanted to try out rotary encoders. I always thought they looked pretty cool with the spinning dials on, on these keyboards and I wanted to see what kind of utility that would offer me. And thirdly, I wanted to know if I could get away with a much smaller thumb cluster. You can get a software board pre-built, but I opted to go uh, the build it yourself option. I actually ordered my kit from mechboards.co.uk, which is in no way sponsoring this video, I paid with my own money. The kit promptly arrived and I set to work putting this thing together. You can build the Soffle with normal MX switches, chock switches. You can have the rotary encoders or not have the rotary encoders. There's quite a degree of flexibility with it. And I actually really like this layout, the positioning of the keys. It's very, very comfortable. Now, because you build it with hot swap sockets, it means that you can swap the switches out. That doesn't mean you can take the MXs out and put chock switches in. That would mean putting a different hot swap socket on each of the points, that's a big no-no. But within the bounds of either MX or chalk, you can swap the switches out. So I've got clicky chalk switches in this one, but I could swap those out for a linear chalk switch if I wanted to. The kits themselves for the Soffle are fairly inexpensive if you've already got your own MX switches and keycaps. Um, because I was getting the chalk route, it ended up quite an expensive build because I needed to buy chalk keycaps and the chalk switches, none of which I already had. So this isn't a cheap, option building this kind of a keyboard by any means. And with these build your own boards, they expect a degree of sort of competency and perhaps more than I had to begin with. Um, but what you do is there's no instructions that come with it. You basically need to go online, find the build guide for this kind of keyboard and follow it through. Thankfully, the one that's on GitHub for the Soffle was pretty self-explanatory and managed to get through most of it unaided. There's a fair amount of soldering to do to get it all put together. But even a CAC candidate like me managed to do it. And I have very little prior um, soldering experience. I actually learned to solder by watching YouTube videos. So I would sort of say, if you're the kind of person that's managed to put um, a Lego Technics pack together in the past, I think you can probably do this no problem. When it did come unstuck, because I know nothing about real world electronics, like using a multimeter, any of that sort of stuff. And um, what I did is I reverted to the, the Mac boards Discord server. And thankfully there's a great bunch of people there who managed to answer all my questions um, and get this thing up and running. One thing that I did come and stuck with is when I was socketing the Elite C board, which is where you, you take the board and you add these sort of feet through it, solder it in, the idea being that you can lift that board off and replace it with another one down the line, which I'll come, up, I'll come back to that shortly. Um, but when I was doing that, I managed to lift one of the, the traces off the microprocessor board, which if you don't know what the, the trace is, it's the sort of the line on the PCB um, that goes from one thing to another. And I somehow managing with the soldering, I managed to get stuck to that basically and lift one of the traces up, which I thought was gonna cost me um, another microprocessor board. But thankfully, speaking to the people on the Discord, they told me that that particular trace went to a pin that I wasn't actually gonna be using in the build anyway, so it's happy days. So yeah, the only part of the build I think I maybe would change next time. Well, perhaps I would do it wireless, but Let's put that to one side for a minute. So this is one of the sort of boards that you get with the Soffle. This particular one isn't a latency, that's a, a nice nano for a, a wireless build that I'm doing, but it's the same kind of idea. Maybe you can just see that there. Alongside the board, there's this little set of legs, um, which you can use to directly solder it to the board, or you can do something where you call socket in it, where you take the old diode legs, or you, you order them from somewhere, and you actually solder those um, to the feet so that you can lift that board in and out um, of that particular keyboard so you could potentially lift your um, your two 
processor boards up, take them out of your software, put them into something else, like maybe you've got a Lily 58 or something else that uses the same kind of boards. Um, these boards themselves are around 20 quid. Um, there or thereabouts. So they're not massively expensive, but soldering, socketing this, the soldering that was involved in socketing the board was a massive pain in the ass for me because I'm not particularly good at soldering. And I'm not sure whether in future I would just forget that step and solder it directly um, into the soffle. However, a couple of months on, I am considering taking the boards out of this one and putting um, nice nanos in instead to make it wireless because you can now get um, screens from nice, uh, they're called nice view screens from the people that make the nice nano boards and they are far more um, power efficient. So that means that you could potentially have a wireless board with, with two big screens on it giving you back information but it's not completely sapping the battery. That was always the problem um, with doing a, a Soffle that was wireless. If you got the OLED screens the batteries would run down very, very quickly because normal OLEDs are quite, um, quite energy intensive. So if you're new to soldering not done many, I would say forget about socketing the board first, just stick it in and have done. However, if you're the sort of person that does like to, to mix it up or you're feeling a bit more confident, maybe it is worth going that extra mile, socketing the board so that you can swap it out more easily down the line. Now, once I got it all put together to check that the thing even worked, I just uh, plugged it in and I went to the QMK online configurator and downloaded the default Soffle key map. Um, and once I've got that working, it's then the QMK configurator doesn't let you do online things like tap dance um, and auto shift and all those kinds of things. It also doesn't support the rotary encoders on the online configurator either. So I had no option but to dig into the code and get that set up. To get that functionality onto your board, you need to get your hands dirty with the key maps themselves with the C code inside um, QMK and then use the QMK tools to flash that back to the board. Thankfully, people far smarter than me have done all this sort of thing already. So it's just a case of me finding somebody else's code, copy and pasting and amending it to suit what I needed it to do. And I've linked my configuration files in the description down below if you do find yourself wanting to go and, and do something similar with yours. One pretty cool thing is the fact that with the, the OLED displays, you can configure them to do whatever you want. So I'm not a big fan of um, layers. So mine just toggles between two layers on the left hand side and shows me that. And on the right hand side, I just managed to make um, a logo of my my site logo onto one of the screens and I'll put some links down below there's a couple of um, online resources where you can go and upload a graphic and it will give you the equivalent kind of ASCII art stuff that you can paste in to get that logo appearing on your OLED but to surmise all this you basically you make your key map in put your OLED graphics in the code if, if, if that's what you want to do flash it via QMK and then you're away finally we could discuss actually using the software now if you've used any kind of split keyboard before, I think you'll get straight on with the software. There's, there's nothing really unusual. Physically, I, I find it very, very comfortable. That's with the, the chalk low profile switches. And they, they make a nice change from the MXs. I wouldn't say that the, the distance and travel is as pronounced as I thought it would be. It's not like something like uh, one of the Apple Magic Keyboards where you know where there's next to no travel. It's kind of somewhere, I'd say, sort of halfway between that and an MX switch, but it's sort of hard to gauge from here, but there's a good sort of three or four uh, millimeters of travel there. And although it's not particular to the Soffle, I really like these MBK Glow um, keycaps, which one thing I particularly like is the homing key. It's got this ridge at the very bottom, which I've not come across that before. And I actually find that's really, I think that's more useful than the normal sort of homing bump or concave scoop that you get on your homing key. And it's also got stacks of very sort of peculiar keys in with the set that you get, you know, so there's, there's all the sort of Mac stuff that you would expect, but then there's, there's some others as well as a couple of blanks too. You know, the special bonus points for the fact that you get homing keys in here for Colmac and Dvorak too without having to go and buy you know another additional set or whatever. So I can really recommend those. Now physically, it is very low to the ground. I mean, it came with little 10 mil spaces that go between the two plates here. Um, and that once that's on and the feet are on, it's somewhere between sort of 20, 24 mil to the top of the keycaps, um, you know, from whatever you're resting it on. So, however, something like the Moonlander with some DSA caps on, that only comes in at 27 mil. So despite this being um, with chalk switches, it doesn't end up being that much lower than something like um, the Moonlander, which has got MX switches. 
Now I did try swapping out the 10 mil little standoffs for four mil ones to like get the sam the two sandwich plates. Basically the way it's sort of constructed is you've got these, you've got the PCB in the middle and then you've got two sort of sandwich plates either side and the top plate has the keys and the switches sitting in them. And then the standoffs between the plates that sort of give you the distance to the bottom of the switches can sit under the PCB. I tried it with four mil standoffs to lower it down and that was just a bit too, too short. So what I did instead, I think um, like six mil is about the sweet spot. And the other thing that I tried out, which I've, I've got in here at the minute, is I cut a layer of sorbethane to go between the plates, just to try and make the acoustics a little bit better. It's not made a terrific amount of difference, to be honest, but I think were I to put this in something like um, either a plastic or an aluminium case, which you can order, but again, more expense. But I suspect that if this was enclosed in a case, that sorbethane would probably help the acoustics a little more. One thing that the sorber thing did help with though is as you press down on the, the rotary encoders because the, the encoders they give you um, like a key switch one way, key switch the other and then you also get a click as you push down as well and what I could see is that the, the PCB board was sort of flexing quite a bit as I press that down and having the sorber thing underneath it does give it a little bit of um, support so I've kept it in for that reason. In terms of the layout, beyond a sort of fairly straightforward Colmac DH. What I've done with the encoders is I've got one to zoom in and out and a click to, to play and pause media um, and on the other side I've got a page up and down and I click it to do F12 which is effectively I've got that to open the dev tools which is you know when web developers so I'm doing that quite a bit. If you are used to something with more keys something like the moon lander you will have to sort of start thinking about how you're going to double some of those keys up or move them to another layer I tend to use the tap and hold sort of stuff in QMK to get around those problems rather than making another layer. Now I said at the top, one of the main reasons I built this board was to try out the rotary encoders. I'm actually kind of a bit disappointed with the rotary encoders and it, it's not something I think I would bother with. Again, I was a bit naive in that I thought they would do something special, but what they're all they're really doing is sending a key press. So as you turn that way, it's sending a key press and again and again. With each little click it's just like you pressing a key down and the same in the other direction unless you've got particular software that knows what to do with a rotary encoder it's not actually giving you any extra fidelity you know you sort of gently turning that is no different than you pressing it one key at a time to do something so despite the kind of the funkiness like i like how they look but in terms of actual utility you, you actually get if you especially if you're limited on keys this space here if i had a key instead i could put a tap dance a tap dance on it and get four things happening whereas with the rotary encoder you're only getting three you're getting left right and a click so something to think about if you're thinking about going down the rotary encoders route i guess in some ways the journey of making this keyboard was the real reward there's absolutely no way you can build one of these as an exercise in good economics Unless you've already got keycaps and key switches, building one of these is almost as expensive as buying something off the shelf. So I would say, unless you particularly want this kind of keyboard and you particularly want to go through the, the hassle or hassle fun experience of building it, you'd be far better served with something more solid like a Moonlander, a Digma, um, Defy or Raze, something of that nature, maybe an Advantage 360. This, I mean, Let's just talk about robustness. Like, look at those screens wobbling there on top of there. I couldn't leave this with one of my boys for more than 10 minutes and expect it to still be working. Um, I've traveled, I, I, I traveled with this a couple of times, put it in a, a carry case. And there was a couple of occasions where by the time I got to, to work, a couple of the screws had fallen out, standoffs were wobbling. It's just not very robust. It's fine if you're keeping it in one place, but you know, it, it's just a bit sort of precious. You know, it's not the sort of thing you can just chuck in your bag. I don't want to completely put you off building something like this, but I think it's important you have some realistic expectations. There is a world of difference between a commercially built keyboard like the Moonlander and something built by, well, me. But I'm going to counter all that negativity by saying that this Soffle is absolutely lovely to type on. I think that the layout is extremely well considered, even for somebody like me who uses uh, an arrow cluster um, as opposed to on the homing keys. Very, very comfortable to type on for long periods of time. 
I think if somebody made this board commercially, you know, in a more robust package, I'd be at the front of the queue to buy one of these. Just as it stands, it's, I like the sort of thing that I can chuck around a little bit and not be worried that it's just gonna fall into many, many pieces when I move it. And again, I say it in almost all the reviews of these sort of home build boards, I'm fine with code. I use code all day long, but I just don't think you can beat a nice web GUI for setting up your key maps and your tap dances and things of that nature. And there's a cost to that. Where so if you if you consider something like a Moonlander or a Digma Rays or Defy or I don't know, I haven't used the Advantage 360 yet, but I imagine that kind of all-in-one package, although they seem more expensive, you've got to weigh up all the the sort of bits of pain and whether it's worth it to you. So to conclude. If you fancy having a go, you like building stuff yourself, the Soffel is a great keyboard. I don't really have any complaints about the Soffel in terms of how it's laid out, what it's like to work with. But if you're after a solid workhorse keyboard that you can throw a little bit and not worry about, I suggest you look elsewhere. If you haven't already, subscribe. See you again next time.